Chapter Thirteen of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange, eventful, and bloody were the incidents that followed. King Edward, burning for glory, had landed in Normandy a little time before, had knighted on these yellow beaches that gallant boy, his son, and with the young prince and some fourteen thousand English troops ten thousand wild welshmen and six thousand irish pillaging and destroying as he went he had marched straight into the heart of unready france with that handful of men he had burnt all the ships in hogue barfleur and cherbourg he had stormed montebourg carenton st lo and valogne sending a thousand sails laden with booty back to england and now day by day he was pressing southward through his fair rebellious territories, deriding the French king in his own country, and taking tithe and taxes in rough fashion with fire and sword. Nor had we who came late far to seek for the sovereign. His whereabouts was well enough to be told by the rolling smoke that drifted heavily to leeward of his marching columns, and the broad trail of desolation through the smiling country that marked his stern progress. To travel that sad road was to see naked war stripped of all her excusing pageantry, to see grey desolation and lean sorrow following in the gay train of victory. Gods, it was a sad path. Here, as we rode along, would lie the still smouldering ashes of a burnt village, black and grey in the smiling August sunshine. In such a hamlet, perhaps, across a threshold, his mouth agape and staring eyes fixed on the unmoved heavens would lie a peasant herdsman his right hand still grasping the humble weapon wherewith he had sought to protect his home and the black wound in his breast showing whence his spirits had fled indignant to the dim place of explanations neither women nor babes were exempt from that fierce ruin once we passed a white and silent mother lying dead in mid-path and the babe, still clasped in her stiff arms, was ruddy and hungry, and beat with tiny hands to wake her, and crowed angry at its failure, and whimpered so pitiful and small, and was so unwotting of the merry game of war and all it meant, that the laughter and talk died away upon the lips of those with me, as, one by one, we paced slowly past that melancholy thing. At another time, I remember, we came to where a little maid of some three tender years was sitting weaving flowers on the black pile of a ruined cottage, that, though her small mind did not grasp it, hid the charred bodies of all her people. She twined those white and yellow daisies with fair smooth hands, and was so sunny in the face and trustful-eyed, I could not leave her to marauding Irish spears, or the cruel wolf-dogs who would come for her at sunset. I turned my impatient charger into the black ruin, and maugre that little maid's consent, plucked her from the ashes, and rode with her upon my saddle-bow, until we met an honest-seeming peasant woman. To her I gave the waif, with a silver crown for patrimony. Out in the open the broad stream of war had spread itself. The yellow harvests were trodden under foot, and hedge and fence were broken. The plough stood half-way through the furrow, and the reaper was dead with the sickle in his hand. Here, as we rode, went up to heaven the smoke of coppice and homestead, and there, from the rocks hanging over our path, luckless maids and widowed matrons would hail and spit upon us in their wild grief, cursing us in going, in coming, in peace and in war, while they loaded the frightened echoes with their shrieks and wailings. Now and then on grass and roadside were dark patches of new-dried blood, and by them, maybe, lay country cloaks and caps and weapons. There we knew men had fallen singly, and had long lain wounded or dead, until their friends had taken them to grave or shelter. Out in the open again, where skirmishes had happened, and bill and bow or spear had met their like, the dead lay thicker. Gods, how drear those fair French fields did lie in the autumn moonlight, with their scattered dead in twos and threes, and knots and clusters. There were some who sprawled upon the ground, still clutching in their dread white fingers 
the grass and earth torn up in the moment of their agony and here was he who scowled with dead white eyes on the pale starlight one hand on his broken hilt and the other fast gripped upon the spear that pinned him to the earth near him was a fair boy dead with the shriek still seeming upon his livid lips and the horrid rent in his bosom that had let out his soul looming black in the gloom yonder a tall trooper still stared out grimly after the english and smiled in death with a cloth-yard shaft buried to the feather in his heart some there were of these horrid dead who still lay in grapple as they had fallen the stalwart saxon and the bronzed gaul with iron fingers on each other's throats smiling their black hatred into each other's bloodless white faces others again lay about whose arms were fixed in air seeming still to implore with bloody fingers compassion from the placid sky one man i saw had died stroking the thin pain-streaked muzzle of his wounded charger his friend mayhap for years in camp and march indeed among many sorrowful things of that midnight field the dead and dying horses were not least it moved me to compassion to hear their pain-fraught whinnies on every hand and to see them lying so stiff and stark in the bloody hollows their hoofs had scooped through hours of untempered anguish what could i do for all those many but before one i stopped and regarded him with stern compassion many a minute he was a splendid black horse of magnificent size and strength and not even the coat of blood and mud with which his sweating sides were covered could hide here and there the care that had but lately groomed and tended him he lay dying on a great sheet of his own red blood and as i looked i saw his tasselled mane had been plaited not long before by some soft skilful fingers and at every point was a bow of ribbon such as might well have been taken from a lady's hair to honour the war-horse of a favourite knight that great beast was moaning there in the stillness thinking himself forgotten but when i came and stood over him he made a shift to lift his shapely head and looked at me entreatingly with black hanging tongue and thirst fiery eyes the while his doomed sides heaved and his hot dry breath came hissing forth upon the quiet air well i knew what he asked for and turning aside i found a trooper's empty helmet and filling it from the willowed brook that ran at the bottom of the slope came back and knelt by that good horse and took his head upon my knee and let him drink jove how glad he was forgot for the moment was the battle and his wounds forgotten was neglect and the long hours of pain and sorrow the limpid water went gurgling down his thirsty throat and every happy gasp he gave spoke of that transient pleasure and then as the last bright drops flashed in the moonlight about his velvet nozzle i laid one hand across his eyes and with the other drew my keen dagger and with gentle remorselessness plunged it to the hilt into his broad neck and with a single shiver the great war-horse died in truth it was a melancholy place on the midnight wind came the wail of women seeking for their kindred and the howl and fighting of hungry dogs at ghastly meals the smell of blood and war of smouldering huts and black ruins a stern pastime this and it is as well the soldier goes back upon his tracks so seldom we passed two days through such sights as i have noted meeting many a heavy convoy of spoil on its way back to the coast and not a few of our own wounded wending back luckless and sad to england and then on the following evening we came upon the english rear and were shortly afterwards part and parcel of as desperate and glorious an enterprise as any that was ever entered in the red chronicles of war from the coast right up to the white walls of the fair capital itself king edward's stern orders were to pillage and kill and spoil the country so that there should be left no sustenance for an enemy behind i have told you how the cruel irish mercenaries and the loose soldiers of a baser sort accomplished the command our english archers and the light-armed welsh who scoured the front were mild in their methods compared to them 
they mayhap disturbed the quiet of some rustic villages and in thirsty frolics broached the kegs of red vintage in captured inns robbed hen-roosts and kissed matrons and set maids screaming but they unlike the others had some touch of ruth within their rugged bosoms but as for keeps and castles we stormed and sacked them as we went and he alone was rogue and rascal who was last into the breach our wild kerns and escaladers rioting in those lordly halls many a sight of cruel pillage did i see and many a time watched the red flame bursting from the embrasures and windows of these fair baronial homes and could not stay it the frenchmen in these cases such of them as were not away with the army we hoped to find fought brave and stubborn and we piled their dead bodies up in their own courtyards many a comely dame and damsel did i watch wringing white hands above these ghastly heaps and tearing loose locks of raven hair in piteous appeal to unmoved skies the while the yellow flames of their comely halls went roaring from floor to floor and in mockery of their sobs crashing towers and staircases mingled with the yells of the defenders and the shouting of the pillage i fear long ages began to sap my fibre there was a time when i would have sat my war-horse in the courtyard and could have watched the red blood streaming down the gutters and listened to the shrieking as cold amid the ruin as any viking on a hostile conquered strand but somehow with this steel panoply of mine i had put on softer moods i am degenerate by the pretty theories of what they call their chivalry far be it from me to say the english army was all one pack of bloodhounds war is ever a rough game the country was foreign and the adventure we were on was bold and desperate therefore these things were done and chiefly by the unruly regiments and the scullion irish who followed in our rear led by knights of ill repute or none these hung like carrion crows about our flanks and rear and after each fight stole armour from dead warriors bolder hands had slain and burnt and thieved from high and low and butchered like the beasts of prey they were on one occasion i remember a skirmish befell shortly after we joined the main army and a french noble in their charge was unhorsed upon our front by an english archer now i happen to be the only mounted man just there and as this silver shining prize staggered to his feet and went scampering back towards his friends with all his rich sheathing safe upon his back his gold chains rattling on his iron bosom and his jewelled belt sparkling as he fled a savage old english swashbuckler whose horse was hamstrung sir john elkington they called him fairly wrung his hands after him to-night screamed that unchivalrous ruffian to me after him in the name of hell if thou ridest hard he cannot get away and run thy spear in under his gorget so as not to spoil his armour tis worth at least a hundred shillings i never moved a muscle did not even deign to look down at that cruel churl whereon the grisly old boarhound clapped his hand upon his dagger and turned on me ah by the light of heaven he did what not going you lazy braggart he shouted beside himself with rage not going for such a prize beast scullion coward coward had i lived more than a thousand years in a soldier saddle to be cowarded by such a hoary whelp of butchery such a damnable old taint on the honourable trade of arms i spun my charge around and with my gloved left hand seized that bully by his ragged beard and perked him here and there lifted him fairly off his feet stretched his corded knotted throttle till his breath came thick and hard jerked and pulled and twisted him then cast the ruffian loose and drawing my square iron foot from my burnished stirrup spurned him here and there and kicked and pommelled him and so at last drove him howling down the hill all forgetful for the moment of prize and pillage these lawless soldiers were the disgrace of our camp they did so rant and roar if all went well and when the battle was fairly won whereto they had not entered they were so coward and cruel among the prisoners or helpless that we would gladly have been rid of them if we could 
but after the manner of the time the war was open to all behind the flower of english chivalry who rode round the sovereign standard and the gallant bill and bowmen who wore his livery and took his pay observing the decencies of war came hustling and crowding after us a host of rude mercenaries a horde of ragged adventurers who knew nothing of honour or chivalry and had no cannons but to plunder ravish and destroy they made a trade of every villainy just outside the camp where with scoundrel hawkers who followed behind us like lean vultures they dealt in dead men's goods bought maids and matrons and sold armour or plunder under our marshal's very eyes one day i remember i and my shadow flamaucour were riding home after scouting some miles along the french lines without adventure when entering our camp by the pickets farthest removed from the royal quarter we saw a crowd of irish kerns behind the wood where the king had stocked his baggage all laughing round some common object now these irish were the most turbulent and dissolute fighters in the army such shock-headed fiery ruffians never before called themselves christian soldiers they and the welsh were for ever at feud but whereas the welshmen were brave and submissive to their chiefs keen in war tender of honour fond of wine-cups and minstrels gallant free soldiers indeed just as i had known their kin a thousand years before these savage kerns on the other hand were remorseless villains rude and wild in camp and cut-throat rascals without compunction when a fight was over in ordinary circumstances we should have ridden by these noisy rogues for they cared not a jot for any one less than the camp marshal with a string of billmen behind him and feuds between knights of king edward's table and these shock-haired kerns were unseemly but on this occasion over the hustling ring of rough soldiers as we sat high perched upon our flemish chargers we saw a woman's form and craned our necks and turned a little from our course to watch what new devilry they were up to there in the midst of that lawless gang of ruffian soldiers their bronzed and grinning faces hedging a space in with a leering compassionless wall was a fair french girl all wild and torn with misadventure her smooth cheeks unwashed and scarred with tears her black hair wild and tangled on her back her skirt and bodice rent and muddy fear and shame and anger flying alternate over the white field of her comely face while her wistful eyes kept wandering here and there amid that grinning crowd for a look of compunction or a chance of rescue the poor maid was standing upon an overturned box such as was used to carry crossbow bolts in her hands tied hard together in front her captor by her side and as we came near unnoticed he put her up for sale by congle of the bloody fingers said that cruel kern in answer to the laughing questions of his comrades interlarding his speech with many fiery and horrid oaths the which i spare you i found this accursed little witch this morning hiding among the rubbish of yonder cottage our boys pulled to pieces in the valley and as i could not light on better where i dragged her here but may i roast for ever if i will have anything more to do with her she's a tigress a little she-devil i have thrashed and beat and kicked her but i cannot get the spirit out let some other fellow try and may heaven wither him if he turns her loose near me again now then what will the best of you give she's a little travel-stained perhaps that comes of our march hither and our subsequent disagreements but all right otherwise and and some one could cure her of her spit for your nature and make her amenable to reason she would be an ornament to any tent now you borgil for instance it was you i think who split the mother's skull this morning give me a bid for the daughter you are not often bashful in such a case as this a penny then sang out borgil of the red beard and with maids as cheap as they be hereabouts she's dear at that and while the laughter and jest went round those rude islanders bid point by point for the unhappy girl who writhed and crouched before them what could i do well i knew the vows my golden spurs put upon me and the policy my borrowed knighthood warranted and yet she was not of gentle birth 
"'Twas but the fortune of war. "'If men risked lives in that stern game, "'why should not maids risk something too? "'King Edward hated turmoil in the camp, "'and here on desperate venture, "'far in a hostile country, "'my soldier instinct rose against kindling such a blaze "'as would have burst out among these lawless hot-tempered kerns, "'had I but drawn my sword a foot from its scabbard. "'And thinking thus, I sat there with bent head, "'scowling behind my visor-bars, "'and turning my eyes now to my ready hilt "'that shone so convenient at my thigh, "'and anon to the tall Normandy maid, "'so fair, so pitiful, and in such sorry straits. "'While I sat thus uncertain, "'the girl's price had gone up to fivepence, and there being no one to give more she was about to be handed over to an evil-looking fellow with a scar destroying one eye and dividing his nose with a hideous yellow seam that went across his face from temple to chin this gross mercenary had almost told the five coins into the blood-smudged hand of the other irishman and the bargain was near complete when to my surprise flamaucoeur who had been watching behind me pushed his charger boldly to the front, and cried out in that smooth voice of his, "'Wait a spell, my friends. I think the maid is worth another coin or two. And he plunged his hand into the wallet that hung beside his dagger. This interruption surprised every one, and for a moment there was a hush in the circle. Then he of the one eye, with a very wicked scowl, produced and bid another penny, the which Flamaucoeur immediately capped by yet another, each put down two more, and then the Celt came to the bottom of his store, and with a monstrous oath swept back his money, and, commending the maid and flamaucoeur to the bottommost pit of hell, backed off amid his laughing friends. Not a whit disconcerted, my peaceful gallant rode up to the grim purveyor of that melancholy chattel, and having paid the silver, with a calm indifference which it shocked me much to see, unwound a few feet of the halter rope depending from his fleming's crupper the loose end of this the man wound round and tied upon the twisted withies wherewith the maid's white wrists were fastened such an escape from the difficulty had never occurred to my slower mind and now when my lad turned towards the quarter where his tent lay and apparently mighty content with himself stepped his charger out with the unhappy girl trailing along at his side his lightness greatly pained me nor was i pleasured by the laughter and gibes of english squires and knights who met us hullo you valorous too called out a mounted captain whose hen roosts have you been robbing and then another said faith they've been recruiting and again tis a new pace they've got to buckle them up and smooth their soldier pillows all this was hard to bear and i saw that even flamaucoeur hung his head a little and presently rode along by byways less frequented. At one time he turned to me, most innocent-like, and said, "'Such a friend as this is just what I have been needing ever since I left the English shore.' "'Indeed,' I answered sardonically, "'I do confess I am more surprised than perhaps I should be. It is as charming a handmaid as any knight could wish. Shall you send one of those long raven tresses home to thy absent lady with thy next budget of sighs and true love-tokens?' but flamaucoeur shook his head and said i misunderstood him bitterly he was going on to say he meant to free the maid to-morrow or the next day when we turned a corner in our martial village street and pulled up at our own tent doors now that breton girl had submitted so far to be dragged along in a manner of lethargy born of her sick heart and misery but when we stayed our charges the very pause aroused her she drew her poor frightened wits together and glared first at us and then at our knightly pennons fluttering over the white lintels of our lodgment then jumping to some dreadful sad conclusion she fired up as fierce and sudden as a trapped tigress when the last outlet is closed upon her she stamped and raged and twisted her fair white arms until the rough withies on her wrists cut deep into the tender flesh and the red blood went twining down to her torn and open bodice she screamed and writhed and struggled against the glossy side of that gentle and mighty war-horse who looked back wondering on her and sniffed her flagrant sorrow with wide velvet nostrils 
no more moved than a grey crag by the beating of a summer sea and then she turned on us gad she swore at us in such mellow beasts as might have made a hardened trooper envious cursed us and our chivalry called us for sworn knights stains upon manhood dogs and vampires then dropped upon her knee and there suppliant locked her swollen and bloody hands and with the hot white tears sparkling in her red and weary eyes knelt to us and in the wild tearful grief of her people for the honour of our mothers and for the sake of the bright distant maid we loved begged mercy and freedom and all through that storm of wild sweet grief that callous libertine flamaucoeur made no show of freeing her he sat his prick-eared wondering charger stared at the maid and fingered his dagger-chain as though perplexed and doubtful the hot torrent of that poor girl's misery seemed to daze and tie his tongue he made no sign of commiseration and no movement until at last i could stand it no longer wheeling round my war-horse so that i could shake my mailed fist in the face of that sapling villain by the light of day i burst out half in wrath and half in amused bewilderment this goes too far why flamaucoeur can you not see this is a maid in a hundred and one who well deserves to keep that which she asks for jove man if you must have a handmaiden why the country swarms with forlorn ones who will gladly compound with fate by accepting the protection of thy tent but this one come let my friendship go in pawn against her and free the maid if you must have something more solid still set her free unharmed and i will give thee a helmet full of pennies that is to say on the first time that i own so many but flamaucoeur laughed more scornfully than he often did and muttering that we were all fools together turned from me to the wild thing at his side look here he said you mad girl come into my tent and i will explain everything you shall be all unharmed i vow it and free to leave me if you will not stop this is all mad folly though out here i cannot tell you why i will not trust you she screamed in arms again straining at those horrid red wrists of hers and glaring on us mother of christ she shouted turning to a knot of squires and captains who had gathered around us for the dear light of heaven some of you free my wretched spirit with your maces here here some friendly spear for this friendless bosom one dagger thrust to rid me from these cursed tyrants and i will take the memory of my slayer straight to the seat of mercy and mix it for ever with my grateful prayers o oh, in christian charity unsheath a weapon i saw that slim soldier flamaucoeur groan within his helmet at this then down he bent mad mad girl i heard him say and then followed a whisper which was lost between his hollow helmet and his prisoner's ear whatever it was the effect was instantaneous and wonderful impossible burst out the french girl starting away as far as the cords would let her and eyeing her captor with surprise and amazement tis truth i swear it oh impossible thou art hush hush cried flamaucoeur putting his hand upon the girl's mouth and speaking again to her in his soft low voice and as he did so her eyes ran over him the fear and wonder slowly melted away and then presently with a delighted smile at length shining behind her undried tears she clasped and kissed his hand with a vast show of delight as ungoverned as her grief had been and when he had freed her and descended from his charger to our amazement led rather than followed that night most willing to his tent and there let fall the flap behind them now that said the king's gesture who had come up while this matter was passing that is what i call a truly persuasive tongue i will give half my silver bells to know what magic that gentleman has that will get reason so quickly into an angry woman's head if you knew that quoth a stern old knight through the steel bars of his morion you might live a happy life although you knew nothing else poor de burg whispered a soldier near me he speaks with knowledge for men say he owns a vixen and is more honoured and feared here by the proud frenchman than at his own fireside perhaps suggested another to the laughing group he of the burning heart whispered that he had a double indulgence in his tent 
women will go anywhere and do anything when it is the church which leads them by the nose or perhaps put in another looking at the last speaker perhaps he hinted that if the maid escaped from his hated clutches she would fall into thine st cairn and she chose the lesser evil it were an argument that would well warrant so sudden a conversion well well quoth the fool we will not quarrel over the remembrance of the meat which another dog has carried off good-bye fair sirs and may god give you all as efficient tongues as sir flamaucurs when next you are bowered with your distant ladies and laughing and jesting among themselves the soldiers strolled away leaving me to seek my solitary tent in no good frame of mind End of chapter 13「14 of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Such sights and scenes as these will show the chivalrous army with whom I served in but an indifferent light, and ill it would beseem me, who remember this time with pride and the gloomy pleasure of my latter life, to stain the fair fame of English chivalry, or to discredit with the foul life of its outer remnant our gallant army or that royal person who shone in the white light of his day the bravest knight and the gentlest king of any then living the sovereign was above everything a soldier he observed all that passed in his camp with extraordinary acumen it was my chance soon after we joined the army to catch his eye by some small deed of prowess in a melee near his standard and that shrewd sovereign called me to him and asked my name and fame the which I answered plausibly enough, for my tongue was never tied by the cold sterility of truth, and then, pointing to where there lay on his shield a famous dead English captain of mercenaries, asked me if I would do duty for that soldier. I knew the troops he had led. They were grizzled veterans, rough old dogs every one of them, who had rode their close-packed chargers shoulder to shoulder through the thick tangles of a hundred fights. I had seen them alone, those stern old fellows put down their lances and all together like the band of close united brothers that they were go thundering over the dusty french campagnas and to the music that they loved so well of ringing bits and hollow sounding scabbards of steel martingale and harness delighting in the dreadful odds charge ten times their number and burst through the reeling enemy and override and trample him down and mow great swathes from his seething ranks and revel in that thunderous carnage as if the red dust of the melee were the sweetest air that had ever fanned their aged beards ah prince i said speaking out boldly as that remembrance came before me by thor if those good fellows will take so young a one as i for leader in place of a better i will gladly let it be a compact they will have you readily enough replied the king even if it were not mine by right to name their captain according to the rules and mounting the grey palfrey he rode in camp the better to spare his roan war-horse he took me to where the troops were ranged up after the charge that had cost them their leader and gave them over to me thus was i provided with a lordly following and the king's gratitude for my poor service expressed but still i appeared strangely to haunt the sovereign's memory he looked back at me once or twice as though I was something most uncommon, and not long afterwards he would have me sup with him. It happened as we fell back from the farthest limit of our raid, burning and plundering as we went along the Somme. One evening a fair French chateau on a hill, bending down by grassy slopes to the slow stream below, had fallen to our assault. In truth, that fair pile had found us rude visitors, twice in the storm the red flames had burst out of its broad upper corridors and twice had been subdued its doors and gateways were beaten in its casements burst and empty the moat about it was full of dead men the ivy hung in unsightly tatters from its turrets and on the smooth grass glacis coping-stone and battlement hurled on us by the besieged as we swarmed to the ladders lay in crumbling ruins yet it was as i say a stately place even in its new-made desolation 
and i was standing at the close of a long dusty autumn day by my tent door watching the yellow harvest moon come over the low french hills and shedding as it rose a pale light over the english camp and that lordly place a little set back from it when down through the twilight came a page who wore on sleeve and tunic breast the royal cognizance was i he questioned the stranger knight new come from england and that being answered he gave his message king edward would be glad if that knight would take his evening meal with him i went how could i else and there in the great torn and disordered hall of the castle we had taken was a broad table spread and already laid with rough magnificence page and squire were hurrying here and there in that stately pillared chamber spreading on the tables white linens that contrasted most strangely with the black new-made smoke-stains on the ceiling piling on them gold and silver basins and ewers and plates bent and broken just as our men-at-arms had saved them from pillaged crypts or rifled treasure cells others were fixing a hundred gleaming torches to the notched scarred columns of that banquet place and while one would be wiping half-dried blood of french peer and peasant from floor and doorway or sprinkling rushes or sawdust on those gory patches another was decanting redder burgundy the which babbled most pleasantly to thirsty soldier ears as it passed in gushing streams from the cellar skins to supper flagon it was an episode full of quaint contradictions but it was not at the feast i looked not at the gallant table already flashing back the gleaming crimson lights from its stored magnificence there round that hall in groups and twos and threes chatting while they waited laughing and talking over the incidents of the day were some hundred warlike english nobles and amid them the most renowned warrior where all were famous the tallest and most resolute looking in a circle of heroes stood the king his quick restless eye saw me enter and he came towards me slighting my reverence and taking my hand like one good soldier welcoming another he led me round that glittering throng making me known to prince and captain and knight and noble and ever as we went a hush fell upon those gallant troops maybe it was all the king's presence but i doubt it it was not on him all eyes were fixed so hard it was not for him those stern soldiers were silent a spell and then fell to whisper and wondering among themselves as we passed down the pillared corridor ah nor was it all on account of that familiar kingly host that the page-boys in gaping wonder upset the red wine and the glamoured sewers forgot to set down their loaded dishes as they stood staring after us no matter i was getting accustomed to this silent awe and little regarded it it was but the homage i thought their late-born essences paid unwitting to my older soul well we talked and laughed a spell seeming to wait for something the while the meat grew cold and then the arras over the great arch at the bottom of the hall lifted and with hasty strides like those late to a banquet came in two knights the first was black from top to toe black was his dancing plume black was his gleaming armour black were his gloves and gyves and never one touch of colour on him but the new golden spurs upon his heels and the broad jewel belt that held his cross-handled sword as this dusky champion entered a smile of pleasure shone over the king's grave face he ran to him and took his hand the while he put his other affectionately on his shoulder my dear boy he said forgetting monarch in father i have been thinking of thee for an hour you are working too hard you must be weary are there no tough captains in my host that you must be in the saddle early and late and do a hundred of the duties of those beneath you trying with that young hand of yours each new set stake of our evening palisades sampling the rude soldiers supper rations seeing the troop go down to water and counting and conning the lay of the frenchman's twinkling watchfire my dear hungry lad you are overzealous you will make me grieve for that new knighthood i have put upon you the black prince then sixteen years old was knighted on the normandy beach where the expedition landed oh tis all right father i am but trying to infuse a little shame of their idle ways into this silken company of thine but i do confess i'm as hungry as well can be hast saved a drink of wine and a loaf for me saved a loaf for thee my handsome boy 
why thou shouldst have a loaf though it were the last in france and though the broad stream of england's treasure were run dry to buy it we have waited we have not e'en uncovered why then father i will set the example here some of you squires discover me i have been plated much too long and the ready pages ran forward and with willing fingers rid the young prince of his raven harness they unbuckled and unriveted him until he stood before us in the close-fitting quilted black silk that he wore beneath and i thought as i stood back a little way and watched that never had i seen a body at once so strong and supple then he ran his hands through his curly black hair and took his place midway down the table the king sat at the head and when the chaplain had muttered a latin grace we fell to work it was a merry meal in that ample hall still littered under the arches with the broken rubbish of the morning's fight the courteous english king sat smiling under the stranger canopy and overhead rocking in the breeze that came from broken casements were the tattered flags our dead foemen's hands had won in many wars our table shone with heaped splendour shot out from the spoil carts at the door the king's seneschal blazed behind his chair in cloth of gold while honest rough troopers in weather-stained leather and rusty trappings pressed on the moment to do squire's duty waited upon us and ministered after the fashion of their stalwart inexperience to our needs amid all those strange surroundings we talked of wine and love and chivalry we laughed and drank tossing off our beakers of red burgundy to the health of that soldier sovereign under the dais and drank deep bumpers to the grey to-morrow that was crimsoning the eastern windows ere we had done indeed we did that night as soldiers do who live in pawn to chance and snatch hasty pleasures from the brink of the unknown while the close foemen's watchfires shine upon their faces and each forethinks as the full cup circle how well he may take his next meal in paradise of all the courtly badinage and warrior mirth that ran round the loaded table while plates were emptied and tankards turned but one thing lives in my mind truth was a strange chance a most quaint conjunction that brought that tale about and put me there to hear it i have said that when the black prince entered the banquet hall there came another knight behind him a strong tall young soldier in glittering mail something in whose presence set me wondering how or where we two had met before ere i could remember who this knight might be the king and prince were speaking as i have set down and then the trumpets blew and we fell to meat and wine with soldier appetites and the unknown warrior was forgotten until when the feast was well begun looking over the rim of a circling silver goblet of malmsey i was lifting at a youth who had just taken the empty place upon my right there jove how it's made me start unhelmeted unharnessed lightly nodding to his comrades and all unwotting of his wondrous neighbourhood was that same lord codrington that curly-headed gallant who had leant against me in the white moonlight of st olaf's cloisters when i was a blessed relic a silent mitred listening long dead miracle gods you may guess how i did glare at him over the sculptured rim of that great beaker the while the red wine stood stagnant at my lips and then how my breath did halt and flag as presently he turned slow and calm upon me and there a foot apart the living and the dead were face to face and front to front i scarce durst breathe as he took the heavy pledge cup from my hand would he know me would he leap from his seat with a yell of fear and wonder and there from some distant vantage point among the shadowy pillows with trembling finger impeach me to that startled table hoth i saw in my mind's eye those superstitious warriors tumbling from their places the while i alone sat gloomy and remorseful at the littered trestles and huddling and crowding to the shadows as they would not for a thousand frenchmen while that brave boy with chattering teeth and white fingers clutched upon the kingly arm did incoherent tell my tale and with husky whisper say how twas no soldier of flesh and blood who sat there alone at the long white table under the taper lights self-damned by his solitude i waited to see all this and then that soldier nothing wotting 
glanced heedlessly over me. He wiped his lips with his napkin, and took a long draught of the wine within the cup, then smiling as he handed it on, and turning lightly round as he laughed. "'A very good tankard indeed, Sir Stranger, such a one as is some solace for eight hours in a Flemish saddle. But there was just a little too much nutmeg in the brew this time. Didst thou not think so?' I murmured some faint agreement, and sat back into my place, watching the great beaker circle round the table, while my thoughts idly hovered upon what might have chanced, had I been known, and how I might have vantaged or lost by recognition. Well, the chance had passed, and I would not take it back, and yet surely fate was sporting with me. The cup had scarcely made the circle, and had been drained to the last few drops among the novices at the farther end, when I was again in that very same peril. "'You are new from England, Lord Warringham,' the young earl said across to me, to a knight upon my other hand. "'Is there late news of interest to tell us?' hardly one sentence all the news we had was stale reports of what you here have done men's minds and eyes have been all upon you and each homeward courier has been rifled of his budget at every port and village on his way by a hundred hungry speculators as sharply as though he were a rich wanderer beset by footpads on a lonely heath the common people are wild to hear of a great victory and will think of nothing else there is not one other voice in england saving perhaps that some sleek city merchants do complain of new assessments and certain reverent abbots tis said of the havoc you have played with this year's vintage yes answered the earl with a laugh one can well believe that last sanctity i have had late cause to know is thirsty work why the very abbot of st olaf's himself usually esteemed a right reverend prelate did charge me at my last confessional to send him hence some vats of malmsey no doubt he shrewdly foresaw this dearth that we are making. What? exclaimed the other knight, staring across me. Hast thou actually confessed to that bulky saint? Mon Dieu, but you are in luck. Why, Lord Earl, thou hast disburdened thyself to the wonder of the age, to the most favoured son of the Mother Church, the associate of beatified beings, and the particularly selected of the apostles. Dost not know the wonder that has happened to St. Olaf's? not a whit it was ordinary and peaceful when i was there a few weeks back then by my spurs there is some news for you you remember that wondrous thing they had that sleeping image that men swore was an actual living man and the holy brothers who no doubt were right declared was a blessed saint that died three hundred years ago you too must know him sir he said turning to me and looking me full in the face you must know him if you ever were at st olaf's yes i answered calmly returning his gaze i have been at st olaf's at one time or another and i doubt if any man living knows that form you speak of better than i do myself and i put in the devout young girl know him too a holy and very wondrous body surely god's beneficence still shields him in his sleep shields him why codrington he has been translated removed just as he was to celestial places tis on the very word of the abbot himself we have it and where good men meet and talk in england no other tale can compete for a moment with this one out with it bold warringham surely such a thing has not happened since the time of elijah tis simple enough and i had it from one who had it from the abbot's lips that saintly recluse had spent a long day in fast and vigils amid the cloisters of his ancient abbey so he said and when the evening came had knelt after his want an hour at the shrine lost in holy thought and pious exercise nothing new or strange appeared about the wonder it lay as it had ever lain silent in the cathedral twilight and the good man full of gentle thoughts and celestial speculations if we may take his word for it and god forfend i should do otherwise the holy father even bent over him in fraternal love and reverence the while he says the beads ran through his fingers as ave and pater noster were told to the sleeping martyr's credit by scores and hundreds not a sign of life was on the dead man's face he slept and smiled up at the vaulted roof just as he had done year in and out beyond all memory and therefore as was natural the abbot thought he would sleep on while two stones of the cathedral stood one upon another he left him and pacing down the aisles wended to the refectory where the brothers had near done their evening meal 
and there still in holy meditation sat him down to break that crust of dry bread and drink that cup of limpid water which he told my friend was his invariable supper hast thou ever seen the reverend father good warringham queried a young knight across the table as the story-teller stopped for a moment to drink from the flagon by his elbow yes i have seen him once or twice why so have i laughed the young soldier and by all the saints in paradise i do not believe he sups on husks and water believe or not as you will it is a matter between thyself and conscience the abbot spoke and i have repeated just what he said on with the story lord earl laughed another we are all open-mouthed to hear what came next and even if his reverence in holy abstraction of course doth sometime dip fingers into a venison pasty by mistake for a bread trencher or gets hold of the wine vessel instead of the water beaker it is nothing to us suppose the reverent meal was ended as jerome says it should be in humble gladness what came then what came then cried warringham why the monks were all away the tapers burnt low the abbot sat there by himself his praying hands crossed before him when wide the chancery door was flung and there in his grave clothes white and tall was the saint himself every head was turned as the english knight thus told his story and while the younger soldiers smiled disdainfully good codrington at my side crossed himself again and again and i saw his soldier lips trembling as prayer and verse came quick across them ah the saint was on foot without a doubt and it might have chilled all the breath in a common man to see him stand there alive and witful who had so long been dead and mindless to meet the light of those sockets where the eyes had so long been dull but tis a blessed thing to be an abbot to have a heart whiter than one's mother's milk and a soul of limpid clearness that holy friar without one touch of mortal fear it is his very own asseveration rose and welcomed his noble guest and sat him at the dais and knelt before him and adored and bold in goodness waited to be cursed or canonized withered by a glance of those eyes no man could safely look on or hoist straight to saint peter's chair just as chance should have it wonderful and marvellous gasped codrington i would have given all my lands to have knelt at the bottom of that hall whose top was sanctified by such a presence and i cried another knight would have given this dinted suit of milan that i sit in and a tattered tent somewhere on yonder dark hillside the which is all i own of this world to have been ten miles away when that same thing happened surely it was most dread and grim and may heaven protect all ordinary men if the fashion spreads with saints they will not trouble you no doubt good comrade this one rose in no stern spirit to rebuke but as the pale commissioner of heaven to reward virtue and bless merit ill would it beseem me to tell or you common gross soldiers of the world to listen to what passed between those two to a rank sacrilege to mock the new risen's words by retailing them over a camp table even though the table be that of the king himself and who are we rough unruly sons of mother church that we should submit to repetition the converse of a prelate with one we scarce dare name whereon warringham drank silently from his goblet and half a dozen knights crossed themselves devoutly and there is another reason why i should be silent he continued the abbot will not tell what passed between them only so much as this he gives out with modest hesitance that his holy living and great attainment had gone straighter to heaven than the smoke of abel's altar fire and thus on these counts and others he had been specially selected for divine favours and his ancient church for miracle the priest so the wonder vowed must be made a cardinal and have next reversion of the papal chair meanwhile pilgrims were to hold the wonder shrine of st olaf's no less holy tenantless than tenanted to be devout and above all things liberal and pray for the constant intercession of that messenger who could no longer stay whereon quoth the abbot a wondrous light did daze the watcher's sight unheard unseen of other men the walls and roof fell wide apart and then and there amid a wondrous hum of voices and countless shooting stars that presence mounted to the sky 
and the abbot fell fainting on the floor truly a strange story and like to make st olaf's coffers fuller than king edward's are and to do sterling service to the reverend prior what think you sir said one turning to me who had kept silent all through this strange medley of fact and cunning fiction is it not a tale that greatly redounds to the holy father's credit and like to do him material service no doubt i answered it will serve the purpose for which twas told but whether the adventure be truly narrated or not only the abbot and he who sups with him can know ah they laughed and by our lady you may depend upon it the priest will stick to his version through thick and thin and by all oaths rolled into one i fiercely cried striking my fist upon the table till the foeman's silver leapt for the lying abbot's story had moved my wrath by thor and odin by cruel osiris by the bones of hengist and his brother that saint will never contradict him shortly after we rose and each on his rough pallet sought the rest a long day's work had made so grateful yes we sought it but to one at least it would not come for long hour after hour i paced in meditation about my tent with folded arms and bent head thinking of all that had been or might have been and after that supper of suggestions the last few weeks rose up strongly before me again and again all that i had seen and done in that crowded interval swept by my eyes but the one thing that stayed while all others faded the one ever-present shadow among so many was the remembrance of the fair unhappy girl isabel full of rougher thoughts i have not once spoken of her yet since we landed on this shore her winning presence had grown on me every day i lived and now to-night here close on the eve as we knew it of a desperate battle wherefrom no man could see the outcome the very darkness all about me after the flickering banquet lights was full of isabel i laughed and frowned by turn to myself in my lonely walk that evening to find how the slighted girl was growing upon me was i a silly squire at a trysting place decked out with love-knots and tokens a green gallant in a summer wood full of sighs and sonnets to be so witched by the bare memory of a foolish white wench who had fallen enamoured of my swart countenance it was idle nonsense i would not yield i put it behind me and thought of to-morrow the good king and my jolly comrades and then there again was the outline of isabel's fair face in the yellow rift of the evening sky there were isabel's clear eyes fixed gentle and reproachful on me and the glimmer of her white draperies amid the shifting shadow of the tent and even the evening wind outside was whispering as it came sighing over the wild grasslands isabel ah and there was something more behind all that thought of isabel there were eyes that looked from isabel's shadowy face wherever in my fancy i saw it that filled me with a strange unrest and a whisper behind the whispers of that maiden voice that was hers and yet was not a fine thin music that played upon the fibres of my heart a presence behind a haunting presence a meaning behind a meaning that stirred me with the strangest fancies and before another night was over i understood them well in fact indeed i was in love like many another good soldier and long did i strive to find a specific for the gentle malady but when this might not be why i laughed the thing itself must needs be borne twas a common complaint and no great harm when the war was over i would get back to england and if the maid were still of the same way of thinking had i not stood a good many knocks and buffets in the world a little ease would do me good ah a very fair maid a fair maid indeed and her dower some of the fattest land you could find in a dozen shires thus schooling myself to think a due entertainment of the malady were better than a churlish cure i presently decided to write to the lady for i argued if to-morrow ends as we may hope it may why the letter will be a good word for a homeward travelling hero crowned with new plucked bays and if to-morrow sees me stiff and stark down in yon black valley among to-morrow's silent ones still twill be a meet parting and i owe the maid a word or two of gentleness i determined therefore to write to her at once a scroll not of love 
for i was not ripe for that but of compassion of just those feelings that one has to another when the spark of love trembles to the kindling but is not yet ablaze and because i did not know my own mind to any certainty and because that youth flamaucoeur was both shrewd and witty as ready-witted and as nimble indeed with tongue and pen as though he were a woman i determined it should be he who should indite that epistle and ease my conscience of this duty which had grown to be so near a pleasure i sent forthwith for flamaucoeur and he came at once as was his wont sheathed in comely steel from neck to heel his close-shut helm upon his head but all weaponless as usual save for a toy dagger at his side good friend i said you carry neither sword nor mace that is not wise in such a camp as this and while the frenchman's watchfires smoke upon the eastern sky but never mind i will arm thee myself for the moment here passing him the things a writer needs here is a little weapon wherewith they say much mischief has been done at one time or another in the world and some sore wounds taken and given wield it now for me in kinder sort and write me the prettiest epistle thou canst not too full of hare-brained love or the nonsense that minstrels deal in but friendly suave and gentle courteous to my lady love to whom gasped flamaucoeur stepping back a pace pardieu boy i laughed i spoke plain enough why thou consumed dog in the manger while thy own heart is confessedly in condition of eternal combustion may not another knight even warm himself by a spark of love without your glowering at him so between the bars of thine iron muzzle come why should not i love a maid as well as you ah and write to her a farewell on the eve of battle oh write to whom you will but i cannot will not help you and the youth who knew nothing of my affections and to whom i had never spoken of a woman before walked away to the tent door and lifted the flap looked out over the dim french hills seeming marvellous perturbed poor lad i thought to myself how soft he is my love reminds him of his own and hence he fears to touch a lover pen and yet he must he can write twice as ingenious shrewd as i and no one else could do this letter half so well come flamaucoeur indeed you must help me if you are so sorry over your own reflections why the more reason for lending me thy help we are companions in this pretty grief and should render to each the help due between two brothers in misfortune i do assure you i have near broken a maiden heart back in england perhaps she was unworthy of thy love why should you write unworthy gods she was unhappy she was unfortunate but unworthy never why flamaucoeur here as i have been chewing the cud of reflection all these days i have begun to think she was the whitest sweetest maid that ever breathed some pampered sickly jade surely sir knight murmured the young man in strange jealous sounding tones whereof i could not fail to heed the bitterness let her by she has forgotten thee mayhap and taken a new love those pink and white ones were ever shallow shallow you wayward boy by hoth had you seen our parting you would not have said so why she wept and clung to me although no words of love had ever been between us a jade a wanton sobbed that strange figure there by the shadowy tent flap whereon flaming up god's death i shouted younker that goes too far curb thy infernal tongue or neither thy greenness nor unweaponed state shall save thee from my sword and i quoth flamaucoeur stepping out before me i deride thy weapon i will not turn one hair's breadth from it here point it here to this heart damned and choked with a cruel affection oh i am wretched and miserable and eager against all my instincts for to-morrow's horrors whereat that soft and oily youth turned his gorget back upon me and leant against the tent-pole most dejectedly and i was grieved for him and spun my angry brand into the farthest corner and clapped him on the shoulder and cheered him as i might and then half mindful to renounce my letter yet asked him once again come thou art steadier now wilt thou finally write for me to my lemon by every saint in paradise groaned the unhappy flamaucoeur i will not what not do me a favour and please thy old friend isabel of oswaldston at one and the same time please whom shrieked flamaucoeur starting like a frightened roe 
why you incomprehensible boy isabel of oswaldston thy old playmate isabel surely i had told thee before it was of her i was thus newly enamoured what passed then within that steel cask i did not know though now i well can guess but that slim gallant turned from me and never a word he spoke a gentle tremor shook him from head to heel and i saw the steel plates of his harness quiver with the throes of his pent emotion while the blue plumes upon his helmet top shook like aspen leaves in the first breath of a storm and over the bars of his cruel visor there rippled a sigh such as surely could only have come from deep down in a human heart all this perplexed me very much and made me thoughtful but before i could fashion my suspicions flamaucoeur mastered his feelings and came slowly to the little table and saying in a shy humble voice wondrously altered i will write to thy maid drew off his steel gauntlet and took up the pen that smooth fine hand of his trembled a little as he spread the paper on the table and then we began our camp by the somme august twenty fourth thirteen seventy six to the excellent lady isabel of oswaldston this brings greeting and salutation madam may it please you to accept the homage of the humblest soldier who serves with king edward that said flamaucoeur stopping for a moment to sharpen his pen is not a very amorous beginning no i answered and i have a mind first only to tell her how we fare you see good youth our parting was such she weeps in solitude i expect hoping nothing from me and therefore i would wish to break my amendment to her gently faith she may be dying of love for aught i know and the shock of a frank avowal of my new awakened passion might turn her head why yes sir knight quoth my comrade taking a fresh dip of ink or on the other hand she may now be footing it to some gay measure on those polished floors we wot of or playing hide-and-seek among the tapestries with certain merry gallants jove if i thought so well never mind get on with thy missive and i will not interrupt again after leaving your father's castle madam i fell in about nightfall with that excellent youth flamaucoeur according to your ladyship's supposition we crossed the narrow sea and since have scarcely had time to dine or sleep or wipe down our weary chargers or once to scour our red and rusty armour we joined king edward madam just as his highness unfurled the lions and fleur de lys upon the green slopes of the seine and thence right up to the walls of paris we scoured the country we turned then queen of tournaments northward towards flanders at this flamaucoeur lay down his pen for a moment and heaving a sigh exclaimed that queen of tournaments does not come well from thee sir knight thou slighted this very girl once in the lists when the prize was on thy spear-point pardieu and so i did i'd clean forgotten it but how in heaven's name came you to know of that who were not there some one told me of it replied the boy looking away from me as though he were lying well cross it out not i the maid already knows no doubt the fickleness of men and this will surprise her no more than to see a weathercock go round when the wind doth change proceed heavy laden with booty we turn towards flanders we gained two days ago the swelling banks of the somme and down this sluggish stream taking what we listed as we went with the red license of our revengeful errand we have struggled until here fair lady but each hour of this adventurous march has seen us closer and more closely beset the broad stream runs to north of us the burgher levies of amiens are mustering thick upon our right and behind gods so close that now as this is penned the black canopy of the night is all ruddy where his countless watchfires glimmer on the southern sky behind us comes the pale respondent in this bloody suit that we are trying philip who says that france is his by salic law and no rod of it no foot or inch on this side of the salt sea ever can or shall be edward's and for jurors madam to the assize that will be held so shortly he has gathered from every corner of his vassal realm an hundred thousand footmen and twenty thousand horse a score of perjured princes make his false quarrel doubly false by bearing witness to it and here to-morrow at the farthest 
we do think they will arraign us and put this matter to the sharp adjustment of the sword against that great host that threatens us we are but a handful four thousand men at arms all native to the english shires ten thousand archers as many light-armed welshmen and four thousand wild irish there i said with pride as flamaucoeur's busy pen came to a stop there she will know now how it goes with king edward's gallant english why yes no doubt she may responded my friend but maids are more apt to be interested in the particular than in the general you have addressed her so far like the presiding captain of a warlike council is there nothing more to come gads that's true enough i have left out all the love yet that is what her hungry eyes will look for when her fingers untie this silk why then take up your pen again and write thus and madam to-morrow's battle if it comes will be no light affair he who sends this to thee may ere it reaches thy hand be numbered among the things that are past therefore he would also that all negligence of his were purged by such atonement as he can make and all crudeness likewise amended and in particular he offers to thee whose virtues and condescension late reflection have brought lively to his mind his most dutiful and appreciative homage you who have so good a knowledge of his poor taste will pardon his ineloquence but he would say to thee in fact that thy gentleness and worth were never so conscious to him as here to-night when the red gleam of coming battle plays along the evening sky and if he wears no token in his helmet in to-morrow's fray tis because he has none of thine there boy tis not what i meant to say and very halting yet she will guess its meaning dost thou not think so guess its meaning oh dear comrade she will live again and feed upon it wake and sleep upon it and wear it next to her heart just as i should were i she and you were you but it is so beggarly and poorly expressed i said with pleased humility she will not think so cried flamaucoeur if i know aught of maids she will think it the most blessed vellum that ever was engrossed she will like its style better than the wretched culprit likes the style of the reprieve the steaming horseman flaunts before him she'll con each line and letter and puncture them with tears and kisses thou hast had small ken of maids i think sweet soldier well well it may be so do up the letter since it will read so well to be taken by the first messenger who sails for england then we will ride round the posts and see how near the frenchman's watchfires be and so to sleep good friend and may the many named powers which sit on high wake us to a happy to-morrow chapter fourteen